SportsRadioDetroit.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Wrestling Fans here on Sports Radio Detroit. I'm Marty. With me, as always, Ben and Adam. Ben, Adam, it's a football Sunday. We're doing a wrestling podcast. We've got a pay-per-view tonight that we're not going to cover because that's how we roll. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's getting to the point where it's just ridiculous. I mean, there's like two or three pay-per-views a month. It's just – it's completely silly. Um, it's every three weeks, I want to start this week off like. with uh, – Yeah, and, and, and it's silly. And it's, it's – and you know, that, that's another reason we're doing one episode a month. There's so much. There's so much going on that it's it's, it's too hard to cover every week. Like like it would just like, like people would just get tired of hearing us. Plus, you know, real life gets in the way, and this is just a good outlet for us to have fun and just uh, shoot the breeze about, about our, our uh, as Ben said, our guilty pleasure, pro wrestling. Um, but I want to start this one off on kind of a kind of a downer note. Uh, the wrestling world lost an absolute legend in Bobby the Brain Heenan. Um, you know, and it's. <laughs> You hear you hear people all the time sit there and say, "What a tragic loss! What a tragic loss!" I'm I'm actually I actually think he's kind of better off considering the state that he was in. I'm not saying that I'm glad it happened, but I mean he was you know he he looked bad uh, before he had passed, and I think now that the pain and suffering's out of the way, we can all sit back and remember what an icon and career he what he had. Um, I, I just had one one question for each one of you guys, just real quickly. Um, Adam, I'll start with you. Uh, what would be if you had to name one, if you even could name one, which would be what would be your favorite Bobby Heenan uh, moment, whether it's him on commentary or whatever that may be? See, the thing was, you know, he was kind of just a hair before my time. Like when I started watching wrestling, he was still around, but I was probably too young to kind of really appreciate just how good Heenan was. So, you know, most of the memories and stuff are, are, are highlights and things that most everybody knows. But, you know, there's, I, it, does, it always sucks when wrestling loses such an iconic figure. And, you know, Marty, I, I don't really disagree with you. The, the, the guy was, was suffering on a daily basis, so maybe he's just in a better place at this point. And, you know, I, I hope that would bring some comfort to his fans and everybody like that. But I, I don't really have a memory that stands out. But the wrestling world is certainly not better off, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's a perfect way to put that. Ben, uh, what, what, what would be your favorite Heenan moment if you have one? Well, I, I loved his promos. I mean, his promos were always good. They were always funny. The way he would just like fly off the handle were, you know, just he would go from one to ten in an instant. And the the only thing that sticks out in my mind because it's part of arguably one of the biggest iconic moments in the WWE was when the rockers broke up i mean you hear when he's on commentary he's like oh you know these guys they're not gonna break up you know they need each other and then all of a sudden the kick happens he's like i told you so that was gonna <laughs> happen blah, blah, blah. And you're just like man like it was just he was the he was the best heel commentator like ever because he would do he would be the guy that would always get you know on your nerves and then he would do like something like that, like with the Rockers, be like, you know, the Rockers need, you know, they need each other. They're they're going to be terrible as single single competitors. And then right when the kick happens, he's like, I told you so. Michaels doesn't need Janetti. This is good. like it's just like, oh my god. But that that was that was Bobby Heenan, and and he was the exact same way as a uh, as a manager. You know, he was just divisive in a good way, and all of his, I mean, all of his promos though were great. Like you know, the golfing video with Mean Gene Okerlund. Um, that one's always funny because he's wearing a, a traditional golfing outfit, you know, with the high rolled up slacks, you know, yep. a, a sweater vest and, you know, a crazy hat. So, yeah, I mean, him, you know, when I whenever I think of like good old time announcers, I think of him, Gorilla Monsoon, um, you know, Jesse the Body. I, I think of all those guys. And then, of course, you know, Vince McMahon when Vince McMahon would do it. But. Those are those are the three guys that I always kind of grouped together. So it, it the news definitely sucked. Yeah, it, it did, and you know, and you know, like I said, it's he's 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 probably better off now. It's just it's just a shame that uh, the condition he went out. But um, if I had to say a favorite moment for me, it, it's kind of a weird one. You know, everybody you would always hear about how unflappable he was, like how he would never break character, so on and so forth. There was an instance where Brian Pillman unveiled his new his new gimmick, and I don't know if you guys remember this or not. 
that's when he came off as the loose cannon and he went out and he, he kind of like approached the, the commentary booth and he kind of got in, in Heenan's face a little bit. He, he had Heenan so frazzled that free, Heenan dropped the microphone and just walked out. Like he was so frazzled. He had no clue what was going on. Uh, and then he came back out and apologized for it later, but it was just, it was kind of one of those things where he kind of broke character a little bit because he had no clue what was going on. And then of course, when I believe it was ultimate warrior stuffed him in the weasel suit uh, with the big long tail. I don't know if you guys remember that or not, Adam, you're probably a little too young for that one, but, uh, it was, it was pretty funny. They warrior, I warrior beat somebody, one of Heenan's guys. And then he stuffed him in a weasel suit and you know, he didn't try to take it off. was chasing the tail around. It was pretty funny. The next one's kind of a big piece of news here. Um, Asuka, the longest reigning and most dominant female performer on NXT, or if not the most dominant performer on NXT, uh, vacated the NXT women's title, and she's now she's headed to Raw. Uh, Adam, I know that makes you happy because you're a huge, huge Asuka fan. What are your thoughts on 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 what this on, on her vacating the title, and uh, what do you think her the plans for her are on Raw? Because I don't think she's going to come out and dominate like she did on NXT. Well, as far as you know, the NXT thing goes. I actually kind of like that she just vacated it. I, I like the fact that they basically said, hey, you know what? Nobody beat you. That's fine. You don't have to do the job before you move on. We'll have you know a little ceremony. You can vacate the title. I think it kind of shows how much faith they have in her and how they want her to, to move on to bigger and better things. The fact that she's going to Raw, which is still the flagship show, is a big step for her. And actually, I somewhat disagree. I think since... Since the streak is still intact, I think they're going to make a big deal about it. I think she is going to come in and and pretty much shoot to the top of the women's division in a hurry. I think anybody she faces is going to lose for probably at least the first couple months. And I really wouldn't be surprised if she gets the title before she gets her first loss on Raw. That's fair. That's fair. Ben, what are your thoughts on her going to Raw and her vacating the title? The vacating of the title was weird. Only because NXT usually transitions the title over. I mean, it's what they do. Like, you know, like, there's a seminal moment where, you know, the champion loses the belt. And then, you know, they they rise to the main roster. It happens all the time with the NXT title. And when I was watching NXT and I, you know, I heard that, you know, she had vacated it. I, I did the old classic, you know, dog tilt, you know, head tilt to the side. I was like, huh? Like, okay, so that's different because I think it adds to the mystique of Asuka. And I think that's what they're doing because even in the promos that they're doing for for Raw, like saying how she's coming, they're building her up as this, you know, mystique, like mysterious uh, person that... Like no one can figure out. She's quiet. She's shy. But when she's in the ring, no one can touch her. Like no one can stop her. And it's it's going to be interesting. I I don't know if she'll immediately ascend to the top. But knowing how the WWE loves to quick push any new talent now for whatever reason, because um, I think that they think that that person's not going to be successful unless they get a, an immediate push. Um. You know, I could see her easily going against, you know, someone like Nia Jax and like beating Nia Jax and people be like, oh my God, like that's crazy. And then becoming like the number one contender and then winning the, you know, women's belt by summer or survivor series or something like that. It would be that quick. And I don't like it. Like I said, I, you guys know, I hate quick pushes. Quick pushes are cheap. Um, they're unfulfilling. It's quite honestly like a quickie. I mean, it's, it's so it's so terrible. Like it's fun while it's going on, but you know, after it happens, you're just like, okay, so you wasted a month of our time just to give them the belt when you could easily build a story around them and then let them get pushed. But yeah, I mean, especially with, I think Sasha Banks is taking time off. Um, and now there's rumors that Paige is coming back, which I find hard to believe, but maybe a quick push is, um, you know, in order, you know, to, to fill that void. But I'm excited either way. I, I like it when NXT stars get into the main roster because, you know, we watch NXT religiously on this show. So, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm pumped for it. Um, <clears throat> the reason I don't think she's going to go straight to the top is just for the sheer fact that now that they're 
kind of putting her on the flagship show. They're putting her, uh, to, to quote WCW, where the big boys play. It's not going to be NXT all over again. It's, she's going to have to not not so much earn her spot. She's going to have to do a shirt, what Charlotte Flair is going to do on SmackDown right now. She's going to kind of have to have to help push that brand a little more. Like I, I can see her having a long, drawn out feud with with Alexa Bliss or uh, or Bailey even because I know Bailey. She beat Bailey for the title, didn't she, Adam? Uh, yeah. Originally, she was the one who who stopped Bailey and, and uh, actually choked Bailey out to win the title. So I I think they're kind of harking back to that a little bit because Bailey's gonna you know even though Bailey's the consummate baby face she's gonna kind of be like you know what you're my one blemish in NXT it's not gonna happen here kind of thing I can be way off I usually am in these kind of things but it's still fun it's still fun to talk about the other thing I I got really really excited for uh, we talked about it before with Adam Cole Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly making their debut they're in, in NXT. They're kind of running rampant over that roster. I mean, they're just destroying people, namely Drew McIntyre, which I'm okay with. They have a faction name, which I at this time I can't remember. It's it's kind of bland and generic, but they're kind of doing what they want to do. I wonder if you guys have any idea what their plans might be for them. Like, what do you what do you think they could be doing with them, uh, Adam? You we we kind of jokingly refer to you as kind of like the most creative guy as far as booking goes. What do you think they're doing with them? I mean, they, they're just running roughshod. There's, there's been no, no response to them. What do you, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Honestly, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure where they're headed yet. I, you know, I don't know if they're kind of trying to do the Shield Part Two. Um, I don't know if, you know, if you look at NXT, there really hasn't been like a super strong faction like this in the main event scene for quite a while. So I don't know if they're just going to keep them running roughshod over the roster as a way of kind of differentiating them. I'm not sure where they're headed. I mean, if the plan is to keep them in NXT for a while, it would make sense to have them, you know, pretty much destroy people. One of them get the belt and then the faction eventually implode over the fact that all three of them want the belt and only one of the guy can have it. So I'm not a hundred percent sure where they're going, but I'm still excited to watch it. Yeah. I'm right there with you, Ben. What do you think? What do you, what do you think their plans are for, for O'Reilly Fish and, and uh, your boy Adam Cole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love how you're like, your boy, because I can't stand Adam Cole, as we all know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think they're building the faction so that someone can fight Sanity, um, you know, as a faction, because Sanity is never going to break up, I don't think. And they don't have on... um. NXT, a, a faction to, that rivals, you know, sanity in any way, shape, or form. So, it's, I think that's where they're kind of going with it, because especially uh, this past week on NXT, at the end, sanity and, um, you know, the three idiots, as I, li- as I like to refer them to, uh, they went at it. So, I don't know what the plan is. I hope that it's something worth my time. Because Adam Cole is not worth my time in any way, shape, or form. When he was in Ring of Honor, I hated him. When you know, I didn't understand the appeal. I still, I still don't understand the appeal. When he uses, you know, the South Park baby, it, it makes me want to punch him square in the jaw and just knock him out because it's so stupid. So I just hope that they don't waste my time. And so far. Adam Cole not really speaking all that much is a benefit. So I'm happy so far. <laughs> so as the Adam Cole mark <laughs> on the show, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm excited for it. I, I, I genuinely have no clue. I can't even speculate what they're going to do with them. Because like Adam said, there's really no, they haven't really had a faction run roughshod or, or be dominant on the show in, in quite some time. So I, I, I just, I don't know what they're doing. Um, Ben, you touched on on you don't think Sanity will ever break up. I agree, uh, unless somebody gets released or something, because <clears throat> even though Eric Young's voice is really, really hard to listen to, I don't know if you guys ever, ever listened to him talk, it's really hard to listen to. He, he does cut good promos, but if they haven't done anything with just Eric Young by now, and he's been in the company for a year and a half, two years now, I don't really think they're going to. Because I mean, as soon as he came in, they, they put him with, the, with these two guys and Nikki Cross, and that's fine. But it just seems like they have no real direction for sanity. So I'm okay with these two factions uh, fighting it out for a while. I'm okay with that. Uh, I do want to see 
hopefully some some semblance of a plan here coming together soon you know some light at the end of the tunnel as to what's going on but for now it's just fun to watch you know i, I love uh i love fish o'reilly and and uh pay um cole i think they're absolutely fantastic so I, i'm excited to see this one um ben you referred you uh, referenced this one earlier so we're going to go there next uh it has been confirmed that Paige is coming back she's uh she's back at the performance center she's working out several reports have her going to smackdown when she comes back which i'm okay with that's fine because if, if oscar's gonna go to raw i think it makes sense for Paige to go to smackdown and you know let's face it even though even though smackdown has good talent they have one name and that's charlotte flair Becky Lynch has done nothing notable since becoming the uh, inaugural SmackDown Women's Champion. Naomi's been on fire, but, you know, even though I love her, they could, they could probably replace her pretty easily. So I, I think having Paige on SmackDown is going to be a boon to that women's division if she comes back healthy. Uh, ben, you, you were kind of speculative about this. What, what makes you think that it's, that it's just a rumor? Because she has a lot of outside-of-the-business uh, uh, issues to take care of. I know she was a part of a abusive relationship with uh, Del Rio, and she felt trapped by it. I mean, it's been well documented, um, and it was almost like a Stockholm syndrome, where that's why, like, she didn't really want to leave him, and she always defended, you know, him, you know. And I think you need to straighten that out first um, before you make a decision, a major decision to come back and it's just it's something that I mean I love Paige Paige I I always get a kick when she's in the ring she's great obviously she's literally grown up in this business and that makes her one of the best uh female wrestlers but I don't know if it's you know also she had an injured neck you know it's it it's it's stuff like that you know the injured neck the abuse that she suffered which it may be a good thing that she's coming back because it, it could be something that helps her get through, you know, the emotional tolls and ebbs and flows that she's been going through. I just don't know if she's ready. Um, and that's why I'm skeptical about it. I mean, don't get me wrong. I will welcome Paige stepping through the ropes and screaming, this is my house till, you know, I'm blue in the face. Cause I, I totally believe that she belongs in the ring and she, you know, wasn't really properly utilized in the last time you know near the end of her time with uh the wwe but she needs she needs to take care of her personal things first because that's what's been sabotaging her career that's what derailed her career and you know if if she comes back will they get her back on total divas which has turned into a sideshow because they intermingle storylines between the actual wrestling and total divas to you know have that extra connection and it's you know if she's a part of that you know when she was on total divas it was you know she was in falling in love with um you know a lead singer of some band and like even after they were dating for like two i think it was like two weeks like she she already was like well i want to marry this guy it's like come on like like you can you can see this dependency or codependency whatever you want to call it of like how she tries to handle just personal uh, emotional stuff and I don't know if wrestling is toxic for her I don't know if it's a safe haven for her that's why I'm skeptical about it and it if she's truly like 100% okay to come back on her own and, and and get on the right track then sweet that's awesome you know have Paige back but that's why I'm skeptical well, that, that, those are all valid points. I was I was just curious to uh, to your thoughts on that, Adam. When you hear Paige is coming back, I, I know you were a, you were a big fan of hers initially. Um, what are your What are your thoughts when you hear that she's coming back and then she's going to SmackDown uh, potentially? I'm going to echo kind of a lot of what Ben said, and you know, I'm really excited for it, and it's great. And you know, any any wrestling promotion should welcome a talent like Paige. I just, I really hope for her sake, you know, she's got her stuff in line. Because like Ben said, that's been what's kind of sabotaged her career. You know, when she was, the last time we saw her in WWE, yeah, there was always rumors of the neck injury and everything else, but there was always persistent rumors 
that she had just become borderline toxic in that locker room. Um, you know, you just you hope that she's got her personal life in order, she's healthy, and she's ready to go. Um, but yeah, you know, if all that's in line, man, to bring Paige and Oscar into the women's division on two different shows, you know, within the same point, that's a big deal. Yeah, that is, and that's and that's not even counting counting the next uh, group of talent that be coming up from the women's division: uh, Ember Moon, Ruby Riot, um, the the two jackass girls who I can't stand, um, the iconic ones. They're talented. They just get on my nerves horribly. Uh, there's a lot of talent in that women's division to come up, and plus, there's a lot of women's uh, talent that they didn't really tap into uh, that I've seen yet uh, with this May Young Classic, which. Uh, Adam, I know you haven't had a chance to watch it, so I'll just pitch it to you here shortly. Um, but Ben, you and I did watch it. Um, we we had a pretty good dialogue. Uh, we're not going to do a match by match thing like we did with the UK tournament, even though I would love to, because I, I I was glued to my phone the entire time that that tournament was on. I was more upset with the final competitors, the the, the two that made the finals. But overall, but that's a minor complaint because the match was outstanding. Um, but Ben, I want to go to you on this. Uh, the May Young Classic, did you, was there any surprises that you were in there? You were kind of like, wow, I'm really surprised that that person did, didn't go further or that person uh, did go further. Did you have any, any surprises in that tournament? Um, Not really. I mean, it, one major surprise, and I don't – because it's just something I don't get, right? It, it, it's, not, it, it's not any indicative of their talent, personality, or anything like that, but – um, her name's escaping me at the moment, and I'm trying to find it as I'm, you know, filling time, obviously. But the MMA fighter, um, Shane Bay. yeah, who made it to the finals, I I was shocked that they let her get to the finals. I I I don't know why. Like they're trying to build, like you know, her trying to be this leader of the next four horse women, you know, trying to start like a rivalry there. I don't see the point of mixing MMA with, with what professional wrestling is to me. It's just a big, big gimmick. I mean, when Ken Shamrock joined back in the late nineties, early two thousands, it was cool for like, 30 seconds and then it got really ridiculous but you know having Dan Severn who clearly was a fish out of water and Dan Severn is a legend in the MMA industry he helped start it with Ken Ken Shamrock and he like I said he looked like he didn't belong in a wrestling ring and that's for good reason you know you have um oh Steve Blackman kind of come in I mean Steve Blackman was all right but you know again he was still like a fish out of water and that's exactly what she looked like in this May Young tournament. She didn't look like she belonged. She looked extremely raw and it and again, it goes back to what I said earlier. It was a it just seems like a quick push, a quick cheap push so that they can do this whole four horsewomen of MMA versus four horsewomen of the WWE, like building that up to being some seminal moment maybe at WrestleMania or whatever. It's to me, it's cheap, and it cheapened the entire tournament because I don't think she's that talented. She's definitely not that great, uh, you know, with mic skills and promo skills. She's extremely stiff and raw in the ring, and I I don't like it. That's what I didn't like about the tournament was that she got that far. Honestly, if she, I mean it's okay if she wins her like first match, but I don't think she should have went to the finals by any stretch of the imagination. So that was kind of shocking and also disappointing. Yeah, uh, and you you couldn't see it because we left the video on, but I just gave you the biggest fist pump ever when you mentioned Shayna Baszler as your surprise slash disappointment because I'm in the same boat. We all understand, like like, and then you mentioned Steve Blackman. It's kind of funny because he was like the second person I thought of when I'm watching her go. Because like you said, she looked like a fish out of water. Like it just she looked kind of like. She just looked weird in the wrestling ring. Not that she looked bad. I don't think she looked bad. She just looked odd. Like, like you could tell she's an MMA fighter. She's a fighter. She's not a wrestler. And the reason I was so surprised she went so far, she's not, to me, she's not marketable. She can't cut a promo. She has zero personality other than the fact that, hey, I'm a badass and I'm going to hurt you. Like, 
you can only take that so far. And so to me, that was kind of surprising. Uh, but yeah, and the other person I kind of think of, like they kind of booked her like they do with Lesnar. She just kind of goes in and just destroys everybody. But the difference with Lesnar is Lesnar, while he's doing that, he's also kind of putting people over a little bit because he'll let them get their shit in. Whereas she didn't until the finals. So it was kind of disheartening to see that. Well, but like um, going to that Lesnar thing, though, Lesnar started as a wrestler. Lesnar right. is a wrestler. He gets it. Like, that's the thing that I, that I still respect Brock Lesnar for is, yes, he went into the MMA world and, and dominated that. You know, and but he started as a wrestler. He gets the ins and outs of wrestling. He's not this bumbling smash a uh, smash match guy. He knows what he's doing. He's doing everything he's being asked to do because he has a wrestling background. He gets it. He just sells like he's still this MMA guy that doesn't give a damn about you know storylines or anything like that. That's all built in. That is all part of it. He's still playing a character, yep. and that's what I. That's why it's part of my love for Brock Lesnar, because he is. He's still at heart a wrestler. If he wasn't, he wouldn't be doing this right now. Right. And and Shayna Baszler is is not. She you. Then that's what I mean. She's not a wrestler. She's not marketable. She doesn't get it. And you're right. They're booking her kind of the same as being like this, you know, wrecking ball type person. But there's a huge difference between her and Brock Lesnar. Yep. Yeah, and it's like you said, Lesnar's a wrestler first, fighter second, whereas Baszler's the opposite. I mean, it just, you could just see it. Like, anytime they wanted her to do something pro wrestling-esque, whether that was sell, whether that was show a little personality, like, it, it just seemed foreign to her, which is fine. It's not a problem. The same thing happened with Blackman. Blackman was fun to watch for 30 seconds. Uh, and, and that was mainly because of Al Snow. Al Snow made him funny with the head cheese thing. I don't see Shayna Baszler going for something like that, which is why I don't, to this day, I don't think she, uh, I still don't think they signed her. Um, but I, I also don't get the love affair for Kyrie Sane. Uh, I'm not putting her down. I don't, I don't think she's bad. I just didn't understand the, um, uh, Adam, you might know the term. What's, what's the term that the, the people use for, for the internet darlings for wrestling? That's smart. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't get the Smarks love for for Kyrie Sane. I mean, she was good, but she wasn't like spectacular. Like they had her built out to be like the best thing in the tournament. I she was okay. She was decent. Um, I would have preferred to see, you know, Mercedes Martinez or Mia Yim or somebody who's a little bit more established rather than a girl who's been in the business for like two years and you know she's popular because she wears pirate gear. Like who cares? I would have preferred to see someone more established, someone that actually shows a little bit of personality. Um, overall, I was I was really satisfied with it. It was it was it was a fun tournament to watch. I, I really enjoyed it. Adam. I you you haven't got to watch any of it, correct? Yeah, I'm, I still haven't watched any yet, but uh, it, it's on the list. It's it, it's fun. It's 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 fun to watch. It's it's good to see that WWE actually put some stock into it. And it wasn't just. Here, let's put this out just to shut people up. Like they put some time and effort into it, which was great. It was it was a lot of fun to watch. Um, I'm really surprised to see that nobody's well, unless unless I missed it, I, nobody's been signed from this thing yet. You know, you, you, they have people that were homegrown talents like Bianca Belair. Um, uh, who's the girl? The blonde girl with the all American gimmick. I forget. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know who you're talking about. Her name escapes me at the moment, though. Uh, I mean, so they had some homegrown talent in there, which that was my surprise right there was Bianca Belair. I saw her on NXT a few times. I was kind of like, okay, she's not bad. No, that girl is awesome. Like, she is outstanding. You know, she does that thing with her hair whip where she uses her hair as a weapon. And I, she she impressed me the most outside of the people that I was already familiar with. Um, and Piper Niven as well. She's, she's quote, unquote, the big girl of, of the group. She was she was awesome, didn't you think, Ben? Did you think she was really good? Yeah, the fact that she pulled off the Frankensteiner in her match was incredible. I yes. mean, it, it was it was one of the things that when I saw, you know, it going up, I was like, "This is, this is going to be interesting." And sure enough, she did. I mean, she hit it perfectly. She she did the spot perfectly, did the bump uh, even better, sold it well, and and that takes skill. I mean, yes, I, I will let you in on the secret. You're just doing the front flip. The person doing the actual Frankensteiner isn't doing anything. You, it's right. all it's all you. You're the one doing the front flip. You're taking the front bump, 
And when you're doing it off the top rope or second rope or, or what have you, it's it takes some sort of athleticism to still get that flip around because if not, you're going to hit your heels on the top rope. The fact that she did it perfectly and, again, sold it was impressive. I mean, she looked she looked the part. I wouldn't be shocked if they signed her. You know, I, I think that she would be, you know, more than serviceable. Um, but I think the reason why we're not seeing a lot of these um, women signed is because immediately after the tournament wrapped up, most of them had to go back to, you know, wherever they came from, like Japan right. or – uh, the UK, because I think they're still under contract. And I think they can't. And I don't know if they can't or won't. I'm going to go with won't on this one. I don't think they want to burn any bridges just because women's wrestling is still fragile, even right. though we're seeing this great, you know, meteoric rise of it and a revolutionary rise to it. I think they just want to be like, well, hey, let me, um, you know, fin- yeah. Run. Let me finish my contract. I only have like six months left, but I do. I want to come back. Let me sign. You know, let me work out in the you know performance center. I'll do what you need me to do. I just don't want to leave on any bad terms, which you can't blame them for because no, absolutely. Not. I mean, in Japan, they they still let their women wrestlers actually develop. You know, they actually let them become something, and it's just something that now it's just happening you know, in the States and in, in, in the, you know, the WWEs and the TNAs and everything like that. Cause even the knockout division hell 10 years ago was not what it is today. I mean, right. you, didn't, you didn't have wrestlers in the knockout division. They were called knockouts because they were just drop dead gorgeous and they could perform a couple of bumps. But now the knockouts are not only attractive women, but they can also wrestle. So even in TNA and even in ring of honor, you know, they've, they've elevated their game a little bit. So I think that's why we're not seeing a lot of major signings out of this tournament just yet. Uh, Cause it's not like, you know, the cruiserweight division where guys can easily burn a bridge and say, yeah, you know what? Screw that small promotion I'm working at, you know, overseas or down in Mexico, because those organizations will, as soon as these guys either flourish or flounder will easily take any of one of those guys back. So, I think that's why we haven't seen uh, any like major signings out of this tournament just yet. That's fair. Uh, and Ben, before we leave this, I, I want to ask you this specifically because I know I know you had high hopes for. How bummed were you when Tessa Blanchard lost her match? I was crushed because I was like, her name alone is going to get her to at least the second or third round, and that just didn't happen. So, I mean, I was bummed. I, I know that was kind of the one person you kind of had an eye on. What were your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, that, it was just one of the things that, you know, was a swerve. It was one of the things that you're just like, oh, oh okay, so we're not we're not doing that then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, you're just kind of like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> like, like, same thing with uh, uh, Paul El- Ellerling's daughter. It was just kind of like, okay, like, I thought they were going to let those two maybe get to the finals. I thought uh, that would have made sense. It's kind of like a nod uh, – you know, be, because both of them have been in the industry now for like three years, even and they're still yep. relatively young. Tessa, I think, is what twenty two, twenty three, oh, and yeah. and Blanchard's daughter, I think, is like I think twenty four. So they're still yeah. really, really young, but they're already like you know making their own waves in it. And I thought that would have been a great little final, or at least having one of them you know in the final. But yeah, I was kind of shocked that they let her exit so quickly, but. I, I mean, that that was the only thing that I didn't like about the May Young tournament was that some of the exits didn't make sense. Some of the, um, you know, people that won, like, in the first round, you could tell they were, like, you know, feel-good stories. And one in particular was uh, Deeb. You know, Deeb, who's been uh, not – Yeah, Serena, when she was uh, – um, you know, she obviously was in the WWE at one point. You know, she was used for a little bit, and then – you know, battled inner demons and then came back, you know, she came back from it. And, you know, I think it was, I mean, it's a nice story that she was able to come back and, you know, be successful. And I think, and that, I think that's why they, they gave her the win in the first round was to be like, Hey, you know, we acknowledge you, you know, fighting over this, you know, we appreciate you, but it was just, 
you know, those decisions, you know, those decisions of, you know, who gets to advance and who didn't, that was always the head scratching, you know, moment, so to speak. So that's the only like critique I had of the tournament was the people that were advancing and, and not advancing. It, it Some of it made sense. Others, we were just kind of like, nah, that that's kind of a stretch. But yeah, I mean, outside of that, it was, a, it was, you still had good, you still had good, solid women's wrestling in it. It wasn't, it wasn't bad by any, any accounts. Yeah. There was no matches where I sat back and went, oh, that was kind of a garbage match. Like every one of them was really, really good. Um, Adam, uh, and you probably put two and two together, but Serena Deeb, she's the chick that was in the straight edge society with CM Punk and Gallows and whoever else was in that. So that's, that's who Serena Deeb is in case you, uh, in case you hadn't known, cause I know you've got a lot going on right now. So, um, but this next one is one that I think kind of appalls the three of us. Um, ben, I'm going to come to you first on this because you actually have in-ring experience. Uh, in a recent event, uh, Lucha Underground's quote-unquote star re- uh, woman wrestler, sexy star, she kind of went into business for herself. And, and this one pissed me off initially because I'm such a Rosemary fan. But then it, it bothered me even more because it just showed the fact that uh, this chick, will she'll, she'll do anything she wants to do and she just doesn't care about who she's working with. Uh, sexy star went into business for herself and hurt Rosemary. She put her in an arm bar, uh, like a legit arm bar, not a work one. She she hurt uh, Rosemary's arm, put Rosemary out of action for TNA for a little while, and uh, was kind of like, basically just like, I don't really care what you have to say about it. And I know that a lot of wrestlers, uh, X-Pac in particular, was really fired up about it because she had the same thing happen to her uh, when she broke into the business. Somebody went off the cuff and went into business for themselves and, and kind of hurt her. So x view of it was like, well, if it happened to you, why would you, he's like, why would you do it to somebody else? He's like, I'm really disappointed in that. I mean, it's, it's been, it's been all over the place. Um, a lot of wrestlers just being really disgusted with it. But Ben, since you have that in-ring experience, I, I wanted to come to you uh, and, and ask what your thoughts on this. We all know that when you're, when you're in pro wrestling, you're trusting your body and your well-being to your opponent, your coworker, whatever you want to call it. What are your thoughts when you hear something like this? Unprofessional and despicable because Anytime if you're working with somebody for the first time, you do a handshake, and in that handshake is all you need to know. If your hand gets squeezed, you know you're going to be at a high risk of getting injured. If it's a soft, uh, you know, gentle handshake, you know that you can trust this person with your life. And when you're at a Ring of Honor, when you're at TNA, when you're at the WWE, there's there's a standard there's a and it should be in the independent circuit and you know most of the time there is but you see in the independent circuit you know people you know looking out for themselves and and there's a lot of shoots that happen in the independent circuit for whatever reason but when you're at when you're on one of those three tiers or even in new japan i'll I'll add a fourth even if you truly despise the person that you're going up against. And perfect example uh, that just comes to mind is uh, Matt Hardy and Edge. Those two guys literally hated each other with a passion. Yet, when they went into the ring and fought, they made sure the show was good and none of the guys would get injured. And that's literally putting your personal differences aside and personal goals aside and adhering to the code of ethics that you're supposed to follow. Whenever you see someone else go off script or hurt another, um, you know, wrestler just for their own gain, you basically almost, you can almost guarantee that you're going to blacklist yourself because you're going to be seen as, you know, non-trustworthy and you are, you're breaking a code. Like if, if I'm wrestling you or Adam and, I don't like you guys for whatever reason. And, you know, all of a sudden you think, okay, you know, I'm going to do a drop kick, but I, I don't push off of you. I actually deliver a kick to your head right when you come to, you're going to be like, okay, what the hell? And then that's when the match starts, you know, you lose the integrity of the match for that reason, because then you'll get upset. You'll try to hurt me. And, it's just a, a vicious circle. So yeah, whenever something like that happens, it is 
always despicable, and you should be better than that. I mean, you really should. But the fact that you weren't is pretty telling. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that, that's a great point, um, uh, Adam. I want I wanted to get your thoughts on because I was I was disgusted, and not only and, you know, like I said, I've been one hundred percent. I will. I don't care. I'm a Rosemary Mark. I think she's got the most original gimmick in women's wrestling history. She plays it to the tilt, or to the hilt, rather. She's she's outstanding. It is nothing that that woman can't do. So I was disgusted by that initially. But then when you see just what kind of scumbag the sexy star chick really is, it was kind of revolting. And I know a lot of people were like, they're like, no, I'm not working with her. Uh, so, Adam, what were your thoughts on this when you heard this? I mean, Ben covered it pretty well. You know, in wrestling, you have to trust who you're working with. And that's the biggest word. If you can't trust that person and you, you think they can hurt you, it, it's a legitimate issue. Like, I don't know how any other performer would want to climb in the ring with this with this chick right now. And, you know, it's one thing like, you know, if you're in the ring and somebody punches you and actually punches you and, okay, you punch them back just to, like, kind of prove a point or, you know, you're a veteran guy and you're maybe a little bit harder on the rookie than you need to be just to kind of prove your point and make sure they know what they're getting into. That's one thing. To just deliberately put somebody in an arm bar and try and, you know, damn near break their arm is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and... And I've seen some some wrestlers from Lucha Underground come to her defense. Oh no no no! She she's it's just something she's trying out. She's not familiar with it. Bullshit. Because I know for a fact that you're taught at least the basic ground game fundamentals. So she knows what she's doing. She's been in the business for a while. She knows exactly what she was doing. She saw a chance to to take someone who's who's known worldwide now because Rosemary's one of the most popular women wrestlers in the world. She goes all over the place. She saw a way to make her her name get out there more, and she took it. That's that. I mean, that's what that was, and it was horribly, horribly disgusting. Um, and I, I I hope that I hope a lot of guys, a lot of organizations, just say, hey, you know what? We're not going to sign you because we don't trust you. And you know, she. I hope she gets blackballed. I, you don't want to see this kind of crap. Uh, you know, it's pro wrestling. It's all fake and scripted. Blah blah blah. Yeah, it is, but it's it's, it's entertainment, and you don't want to see people getting hurt uh, intentionally. It's just garbage. Um, two more things I want to touch on for this week. One is just a, a signing that I'm excited about. Um, it's not, it's not like a, a big deal cause I don't know what they're going to do with them. Uh, WWE recently signed ring of honor, Donovan Dijak. Um, he's a big athletic dude. I don't know what their plans with him are. He's not great on the mic. I'm going to tell you that right now. He's not, he's always had someone talk for him, which is fine. It's not, a. it's that, that's just more opportunities for, for people that aren't athletes. You know, like a Paul Heyman or whatever that, that just secures them. Okay, they're kind of jobs. Um, I'm excited for him because I'm a die jack guy. I've been a fan of his for a couple of years now, uh, and I'm excited to see him in WWE. And the last thing I want to talk about is arguably the biggest storyline in wrestling right now. If you're watching WWE, you know all about the Roman Reigns, John Cena promos, uh, how personal they are. There's been conflicting reports that they're real as opposed to they're fake, they're just scripted. I don't know where I stand on that. I believe it's a little bit of both. Um, I believe they are given bullet points. John, you go say this. Roman, you go say that, blah, blah, blah. And then they kind of go off the cuff. Well, at least Cena goes off the cuff. You can see you can see Reigns is pretty much sticking to the script. Um, but, I mean, whether, whether you love them or hate these guys, they've had some of the better moments uh, on Raw in the past couple weeks. Um Adam, I want to get your thoughts. I know you can't stand Satina, and I know you really can't stand Reigns, but I, I want to get your thoughts on the, on the work they're putting in with these promos. What, what are your thoughts on these? Well, real quick before I, I jump into that, I did want to mention, uh, I just noticed on Twitter that Cody Rhodes has signed an exclusive deal with Ring of Honor. Uh, nice. so I just thought we should point that out real quick. Uh, it's been pretty cool to see him kind of jump into where he wants to go. Uh, but it's actually the biggest deal in Ring of Honor history, and the American Nightmare will be in at Ring of Honor for the foreseeable future, it appears. That's great. That's great. Um, as far as the Reigns and Cena promos, I mean, you know, that's typically where the best promos come from, They when they have that kernel of truth, where they have that believability. You know, that's why we slammed this whole uh, Jason Jordan angle as Kurt Angle's son, because it's not believable. It's stupid, and there's no reason for it. When Reigns and Cena have been going at it, 
you can believe what they're saying because it kind of sounds true. Whether you read the dirt sheets or whether you don't, like you can look at these two and go, oh, you know what? That's actually kind of a legitimate point. So it's really been fun to watch these two go back and forth. It's fun to see Roman Reigns not say tater tot a thousand times in his promo. <laughs> and my only my only gripe is even though I'm I'm not a Reigns guy at all, this program and maybe they're gonna extend it. This should not be at a flipping no mercy pay per view in the middle of September. This is a WrestleMania or SummerSlam main event, and I I don't know why they're not saving it for that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Because you know, because Cena's not going to be around by then. I guarantee I, it. I mean, Cena is truly a part timer. I mean, I I get that. Then if if he wasn't going to be around, maybe for WrestleMania, I don't know. I just feel like there there had to be a better way around this than just like pigeonholing or shoving it into just some crap pay per view in the middle of football season. Yeah, like they could have waited till Survivor Series, like one of the big four. Uh, you know, and they could have had they could have had Reigns. I mean, even though this would have been you know the epitome of lazy booking, they could have had him pair up with. Uh, Rollins and Ambrose kind of have like a little shield reunion, even though he doesn't have to be with them constantly. It would have been something to piggyback off, and then he could have just went on and feuded with uh, Samoa Joe or uh, or you know uh, Strowman or whatever. Uh, so uh, yeah, Adam, I see your point. I, I agree with you. I I think this is bigger than a No Mercy, but you know, like Ben says, Cena's probably not going to be around, and that's that's fair as well. Um, ben, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I, again, we all know that you guys can't stand these two. We we get it. But I mean, it's 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 a big storyline, and we'd be remiss to to cover it. So, what what do you think? What do you think of, about the work they're putting in? Because Cena's clearly owning Reigns on the mic, and I don't think anybody in the world is surprised by that. But the jabs that Reigns gets in, they're 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 pretty good. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the work they're putting in? I like it. I mean, I just I'm sick and tired of, and I, and I've said this before, and I said this at WrestleMania around. You know, when we did our show back then. It's something that John Cena needs to just decide I'm done. And he can't. And he's doing exactly what The Rock did. And it tarnishes your memories of what you remember the superstar for. Like, The Rock, you know, it was great, you know, that The Rock didn't come back for this WrestleMania, you know, this past year. And now, like when you had Cena be a part of a, 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 a still a stupid match with the Miz and Maurice. Yes. I mean, it was stupid. And his WrestleMania moment is, oh my God, proposing to Nikki. Woohoo. That is, that's when you know that your career is done. You don't care what happens. You're, you literally stop caring about what fans want. I mean, literally the last thing that he has to do, and it was something that even Hulk Hogan did, was turn heel. And he refuses to do that. I don't know yep. why, because I think he would be a great heel because of his mic skills. And he and you can even turn him heel by using him being part-time as the backbone of him being a heel. Like, you can use it as a disrespecting, like, I don't care about the fans anymore. I don't care about who's coming through the curtain anymore. I'm just here for me. I'm here to get a paycheck. Kind of like what Brock Lesnar did when he came back. I'm not back for anything other than being a big game prize fighter. That's literally what Brock Lesnar said he was. He was only going to come back if he was going to get paid a million dollars per match. That was literally how Brock Lesnar came back. And you could still do the same thing with John Cena, but Roman Reigns hits a kernel of truth that I think irritates Cena. Cena can't leave because no one in Hollywood wants him. Yep. He's not The Rock. He's not. He's he's charismatic in his own way, but he doesn't want to do like comedy stuff. Like his comedy stuff in Trainwreck was funny, but he's not willing to be silly. If you want to see silly. Watch The Rock and Be Cool when that came out in, like, 2002. I mean, that, Such a good movie. <laughs> but, like, that's what I mean. Like, The Rock's willing to do whatever he wants and whatever he can't. Like, he does things where, yes, he's this macho, tough guy. Or, you know, he's this, you know, ancient warrior when he did Hercules and the Scorpion King. And then he also does 
a gay tooth bodyguard fairy. and a tooth fairy and you know being a professional quarterback who has to raise his daughter i mean he does stuff like that john cena's not doing that he's not ever going to do that he's going to be well i want to do this because i'm john cena and john cena does that that's why he has a problem leaving and when roman reigns brought that up i loved it because it's true he would have like that's why you only see john cena on the today show as a fake co-host or you know hosting award shows because that's where his charisma limits out and maxes out to outside of that it doesn't max out to anything because he's bland he all he is and this has been the number one critique about john cena from any wrestler you'll ever talk to it's because he's green he all he is is about money he doesn't care about the ins and outs he still runs the ropes wrong that's why i hope one day the rope snaps and you see him fall on the back of his neck because he's still after what over 15 years of wrestling still can't even run the ropes right i mean it's ridiculous and that's why i love this rivalry because you do have a guy that's grounded in the sport in roman reigns even though yes sometimes he sucks and you have john cena and you know it is it's a great rivalry but i don't think it's going to like that's why they're doing it now because i think cena finally wants out and they have to get it done and you know, if Cena then, you know, maybe if he comes back for WrestleMania, he's not going to be in, in like the main event match. He'll be in some weird match that doesn't make sense. And, you know, it, it'll be or like he'll come in and just like be the official host of WrestleMania. It'll be something stupid and not worth anyone's time. So that's why I truly think they're getting it done now. Because I think even I don't think this is going to be the the first or last match that these two have. I think this gets drawn out to Survivor Series because it's something that you can have your first match. Because anything with Cena goes at least three matches. It's not just a hit it or quit it with Cena either. Right. I mean, when he did it with Owens, it was three matches. When he fought AJ Styles, it was three matches. So. Rock. Yeah, The Rock was, yeah, like two or three matches. You never just get one match with John Cena because it has to be all about Cena. So that's why I like this rivalry. I like what they're doing. The promos are fun. They're, they're one of the, some of the best promos I've seen Roman Reigns cut in a while. And I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see where this goes because I honestly think at the end of the year, John Cena is finally going to be like, you know what, I'm done. Because... I don't think Nikki Bella's coming back. And you know, I I think that's I think that way because John tells her I don't want you coming back cuz you you've broken your neck and I don't want you to re-injure your neck. So I don't think she's coming back and if she's not back and if she wants you to be home because Bree and uh Daniel Bryant are, you know, having kids, that's going to weigh on Nikki's mind because you know how those two are. That's why I think John Cena at the end of the year is done. I think when the calendar turns to January, you're barely going to see John Cena. So get it done now. Have it go to Survivor Series and just call it a day. Wow. Ben's predicting like the biggest retirement ever. <laughs> it's not going to be a retirement because he's still going to be part-time. He'll come back when he feels like it. But I don't think he's... I don't think he's, you know, this guy that's going to be sticking. I think this is going to be his, like, last big rivalry. That's what, oh. I, that's what I think it is. Outside that's of that, good... it's going to be gimme, you know, The Rock coming back and doing gimme, gimmick, at, like, stuff. Gimmicky stuff. Right. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe he, maybe he does fully call it quits, which, if that happens, I'm throwing a party at my house and everyone's invited. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, Ben. A lot of people might show up at your apartment. That, that is totally fine. I, I have the space to accommodate. Uh, I don't have anything else. Um, Adam, I know you're doing work for Gridiron Experts, uh, and I read it every week. I try to share it as often as I can because, you know, you can tell us you're, 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 you love what you're doing. And, uh, you know, keep up the good work on the fantasy football stuff, man. Um, Thanks, Marty. I appreciate that, man. No problem, brother. No problem. You're uh, – you know, like I said, I, I look forward to reading every week what you got going out there. 
Um, ben, why don't you let the people know what we got going on, on the network? Yeah. Uh, SRD Roadshow every Saturday from 9 to 11 is live at CRB Radio. And if you want to catch it on demand, obviously stay right here, sportsradiodetroit.com. Same thing goes for Saturday Tailgate, which is right on after the Roadshow. Same with Fanarchy. That's on from 4 to 6 every Saturday in Mitten Sports Talk. Uh, that's on CRB Radio every Sunday from 10 to 12. Uh, you can catch all of them there, Out of Bounds. If you want to catch them live on Facebook, you can every Monday and Thursday. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. Their podcasts are released every Tuesday and Friday. We have the Laugh Tracks. If you are curious, if you want to spend money to see a movie or get you know their thoughts on if Rotten Tomatoes is ruining the industry, which was actually very, very interesting, they have a great podcast. Spinning the Wheels is officially back because it's hockey season, so... Um, you know, we have that going with Jason and uh, Steve and Justin, so they're going to be back. We actually are in the process of getting a Red or Pistons podcast. So finally, even though no one wants to talk about the Pistons, we're finally going to have a Pistons podcast on the network with Marquise, who does Fanarchy. Um, we have the set piece which covers soccer and you know the the european leagues and everything like that that's way over my head you know cuz they call it football and whenever i hear football i think of bashing heads on sunday speaking of which lions srd will be out every week we will talk about things namely obviously what donald trump had to say uh you know uh jim caldwell getting a, a multi-year contract extension and maybe the Lions are going to be 3-0 and after Sunday. Who knows? But we'll talk about that on Lions SRD. That comes out every week as well. And we just have a bunch of other things. We have written content. Uh, we have other shows that are escaping me at the moment, and I apologize for that. But we have a bunch of things for you to you know tickle your fancy, basically. There's going to be a lot of written content for um, Pistons Media Day. Uh, I will be out at the Palace of Auburn Hills covering that on Monday. So there'll be a lot of content. And like I always say, if you can't find something on this site that you like, you're just not trying hard enough. So, yeah. There, there it is. And uh, don't forget, we also do, uh, I'm going to butcher the name because I'm not from there, but Wyandotte football. Ooh, that is that that is that is really butchering it. <laughs> 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 it is Wyandotte football. Uh, <clears throat> we do for right now every – Home game for Wyandotte football. Uh, the Bears are 5-0, and which does qualify you for the Michigan High School State playoffs in Division Two, which I think now this will be the 12th uh, straight year they've qualified for the playoffs. They are undefeated. The only other team in the Down River League that's undefeated is Gibraltar Carlson, who came out of nowhere. They have a really good quarterback that's going to the University of Wisconsin as an athlete. They are both undefeated, and they will play each other in Week 8, so that might decide the Down River League uh, when that happens. Um, but, yeah, I am your guy that does play-by-play for Wyandotte Football, and if you think I am not good at it, I dare you to listen to it because I've been doing play-by-play for about five years now. So it's something that I enjoy, and it's we're actively looking to expand the play, play-by-play arm of Sports Radio Detroit. And that's the flagship of it right now is Wyandotte football. And the Bears, like I said, 5-0 and on the season. There you go. As you can see, we're all over the place. This network is as diverse as can be. And, uh, you know, we appreciate everybody listening to, to whatever shows you listen to. You know, we appreciate it. And uh, that's all we have for this week here on the Wrestling Fans. For Ben and Adam, I'm Marty. We'll catch you guys outside the ring.